This is Kitty Cat, my most cherished OC of all time. I created her when I was around 8 and consistently drew, wrote and thought about her until the age of 14. I was so obsessed I created a huge, multi-dimensional universe for her to live in, complete with a vibrant cast of characters, worlds and lore, all of which have almost been lost. In this video I will be diving back into this messy yet intricate world, attempting a total revival. Will I be able to turn these blatant rip-offs and flat tropes into meaningful characters that I can care about once again? Let's see. Introducing Cynthia, the first character to ever exist in my OC world and the first character I'll be redesigning today. Her original design looked a little like this. I mostly drew her with pencil on paper so she didn't really have a colour scheme that I could remember. She was basically a dragon version of Toriel. Cynthia had the exact same personality as what Toriel had and what I was going for, so Kid Me was like, yup, that's the only way we can have a gentle and compassionate mother figure, rip off Toby Foxes. Cynthia in the lore is a one of a kind creature which is born into every new universe to help it grow and take shape in its early days of formation. I never specified what this actually meant, but I guess she was just sort of a deity type figure. The most important thing was that she created the two other characters which exist early on in this story, Kitty Cat and Stepha, which I'll start talking about later. I decided that as the first character in this universe to ever exist, she has to exemplify the aesthetic, at least the one that I've decided for the first bit of the story. The problem was, Wotu didn't really have a tied down aesthetic to begin with. That's the name of the whole story by the way. It stands for Ways of the Universe. I justified this lack of aesthetic because I didn't really feel like limiting every single world and character I create to a specific look. But going forward, I want to at least segment it into pockets which have their own distinct style. Just so I sort of have these guardrails when I'm making character designs. And for this section of the story which Cynthia exclusively features in, I wanted it to be sort of a biological science fiction type vibe. I think what sums up this aesthetic the best are those models of the cell we used to make in science class with like jelly and gummy worms and stuff. Just lots of primordial sort of motifs. It's a weird one, I know. But hopefully that explains the random bunch of reference images in the corner. To communicate this, I changed Cynthia's design drastically. Instead of being a bipedal anthropomorphized dragon, I decided to make her multi-legged and added many different elements from many different creatures. She is the blank slate of the universe after all, so she could really take any form that my mind could will. Her new lore is mostly unchanged from her old lore. She is still the caretaker of the universe and facilitates its growth, but I decided to give her a solid material which she uses for all these celestial tasks. I called it Stardust, and it's this green floaty sand which she can create out of absolutely nothing and then shape into things like mini planets, stars and black holes. The idea is that she makes the seeds for these larger celestial objects and releases them into the night sky, allowing them to grow into large things and move very far away. Cynthia lives on a little planet she made for herself, which she named Home. And here is where she experiments with new creations and ideas before she enacts them on a large scale and distributes them throughout the universe. Her personality also remained mostly unchanged. I still wanted her to be very nurturing and gentle, definitely a strong motherly presence, but also very delicate in her mannerisms. She's very wise and always knows just how to smooth over any childish spats the other characters get themselves into. She sometimes coddles her children a little bit too much though and is a bit overbearing when it comes to making sure that every little detail is working towards plan. Did I mention she's also the biggest busy bee? I mean, she doesn't have eight arms for nothing. Now let's talk about some of the details of her design. Her colour scheme was also really hard to land on. I had this image in my mind of like a gelatinous glowing texture to her skin and I originally wanted to make her a purplish white sort of colour. I tried to make this happen but every single time she just looked like a big piece of rice. I could not get that image out of my head so I tried making her green and then she just looked like a caterpillar. But before all hope was lost, I busted out this very, very faint greeny white colour and used blue as the shadows. 
She has this green visor and apron in this image, which gives a little bit of contrast to her otherwise ethereal design, grounding her a little. This shows off how practical she is when she comes to getting her daily quotas met, and also hints at the use of stardust in her day-to-day -day life, creating useful objects for her to use. I fell in love with these colours. It was like she beamed straight down from my brain to the screen. I don't know if you've ever felt that when designing a character, but it's honestly the best. And that's what happened with our dragon mum, Cynthia. Kitty Cat's original design actually originated from Animal Crossing New Leaf. There was this blue cat hood hat you could wear and I made a black dress with a red sash using the custom patterns feature and thus came her design. I started to draw her a lot and eventually the cat hood morphed into her actual anatomy. I added the multitude of laws her later like layers of paint. First she was the leader of a crime fighting organisation of animal superheroes, then she was the angel of darkness, a sword fighting hero but also a pacifist, a Cadian hybrid, a goddess, 8 billion years old, reincarnated multiple times, a silly goofy prankster, the leader of three dimensions and also indestructible somehow. I tried so hard to deny it as a kid, but there are two clear traits that emerge from this 10 car pileup of lore. Kitty Cat is a Mary Sue and a self insert. I tried so hard to give her bad traits, but it was always those really lazy ones like, oh, she's clumsy. She's too quirky for people to understand her. And she's really traumatized, I swear. But none of this hides anything. The proof is in the pudding and the pudding says you're a Mary Sue. It gets worse because even if all those lore points could be true, her design reflects nothing of it. I posted a drawing of her in my Discord server, which you should totally join by the way, link is in the description. And yeah, clearly none of this was showing through. Forget Kitty Cat though, I feel like I was the one being judged here. So needless to say, we're gonna have to completely overhaul this design and personality so I can like this character again from a person to character way not a kid to the character they use to escape their life kind of way. First things first, that name has got to go. I decide on Yuka because it's very gender neutral. Yes, I'm warming up the envification beam as we speak. It also has a little bit of a biological vibe to it, so it would make sense that Cynthia would name them that. They were supposed to be created as the Angel of Darkness to contrast against the Angel of Light, who I'll discuss later but I honestly think this parallel is too harsh and carries such a heavy moral weight to it. It also kind of makes no sense in terms of Cynthia creating her children to help make the universe happen and fill a role, because when Cynthia gets there, there already is darkness and light. So I don't know, the original plot didn't really make any sense. Instead, I'm making Yuka's new role the creator of life. They're like this crazy feral kid who runs around the planet experimenting creating new plants and creatures. Climbing trees, tiring themselves out, that sort of thing. I didn't mimic the biological aesthetic too much in Yuka's design because they'll be travelling to other places in the future and I need them to be a bit malleable in terms of their look. I did add a few shape motifs though which communicate their relations to the other characters who exist in these early days of the universe. Yuka was designed with a lot of sharp and dynamic curves in their features. Kitty Cat's original personality was very energetic and vivid, and I wanted this to be reflected in her spiritual successor Yuka, both in their personality too, but also in their design. I had to divorce the YA mousy brown hair that I gave Kitty Cat based on what I looked like at the time. So instead, I guess we're going for a bit more of an anime protagonist now. As well as their hair being blue, they also have green streaks, as a little inside joke between me and myself. My first, first ever self sonar was a magical princess that lived in a universe called Adromala, and she had a green streak in her hair because it seems my favourite colour has always found its way back to me. I also made Yuka's ears longer and blended them into a shorter, spikier haircut. I like to imagine that they often flick around their ears to convey their mood and also to show off their infinite wealth of energy. I changed the design for the tail for the same reason. I wanted to make more elements dynamic. So instead of a cat tail, Yuka now has more of a lizard type tail. The end is very articulated and they curl it and uncurl it when they're excited or nervous. Similar to how you'd wring your hands or tap your feet. In this ref, I'm drawing Yuka without a mouth. 
They do actually have a mouth that is visible, but for stylization and design purposes, I leave it out. I would only draw it when they're gritting or eating something, and for the record, they still do have that missing tooth. But why I draw yuca without a mouth sometimes is because they do not exchange spoken or written communication in the redesign. For them, it isn't a trauma response or a physical incapability. They just see the world in a different way. Instead of communicating information by reading things or talking to people, they use their high perceptive skills and clever noggin to interpret body language and figure the situation out. Because of this, they're capable of seeing through deception or fronts and overcoming intergalactic language barriers. The way they see the world is actually clearer and more accurate than most. But when it comes to communicating with people who trust written and verbal communication above everything else, there are definitely some barriers, which will create some interesting conflicts later considering that Yuka's role for the main story is a diplomat waging peace. And in terms of other people understanding Yuka, they have very expressive body language, which is helped by their leaping energy and various dynamic features that I talked about before. And when Yuka wants something or needs something done, they usually just go and do it themselves rather than asking other people. And as for communicating their moral values, you know what they say, actions speak louder than words. Yuka is just that real go-getter type. They need to go out and do, and they rarely, rarely mime things to people. They never aim to mimic spoken communication and they don't really see it as something they need. Moving on, the weapon I drew Yuka with is a staff or a bow, or just a really long stick. I don't know what to call it just yet because it will likely change throughout the entire story, but I know one thing is for sure, they are ditching that sword. As a pacifist and the creator and protector of life, I don't think it's right for them to go around stabbing people in their guts. It just doesn't sit. I wanted to make their fighting style very evasive and agile, more focused on blocking or throwing the opponent so that they won't be gravely injured but still be puffed enough that they'll yield or give Yuka an opening to escape. Sometimes they will dish out a kick or two though to knock an opponent down. I also wanted their fighting style to be very vivacious and focused on balance and leveraging height with a lot of jumps and crouches. I think the stick makes sense considering this. They use it in more of a defensive way rather than striking and slashing. It's more of an extra tool for movement and also blocking in the battlefield. They also carry it around for everyday mobility purposes, being able to lean on it when their missing leg flares up and their phantom pain start getting menacing. Yuka's prosthetic legs and markings are lovely indications of their traumatic backstory. Yay! Their pre-trauma design doesn't have either of these features. And that particular version of Yuka shows when they used to live on their home planet with Cynthia and their sibling and just chill and make plants in the garden as the creator of life. That was their whole job. But one day their little sibling had sort of a breakdown and murdered Cynthia, their own mother. Yuka walks in on this scene and the god blood that splashes onto them permanently stains their skin black in the places it touched. This also strips their creation powers away, sort of like a curse losing their godly privileges for being witness to this horrible betrayal. The cherry on the cake is that when Yuka tries to get away from their murderous sister, they turn back to try and plead with them and search for any goodness left in their soul. In this fraction of time, their sibling takes hold of their legs and, you know, butter bing, butter boom, no more leg. I don't want to get too demonetized. In the original kitty cat version, pretty much the same thing happened but Kitty Cat just walked away with like no scars whatsoever and no hit to their magical powers. Instead, I think the idea of a fallen deity with the will of the universe behind them trying to push them back up on their feet is a much more interesting starting place for Yuka's character in the main events of the story. I think it's probably important to talk about Yuka's central value in their huge universe spanning adventure. As the creator of life, Yuka believes that they created every single creature with goodness in their heart. That is their driving belief. I write it as a quote on the ref, but they don't actually verbally say this, but of course it drives everything they do and aim to accomplish in the story. After the murder of their mother, they still love their sister and still believe that as a living creature, they have good in their heart. But sometimes this belief can be a weakness because that's what their sister exploits to destroy their leg. 
It's a reason why Yuka often gives people second chances and is so optimistic, because they believe that all they created has inherent good within them. This doesn't make Yuka completely ignorant though. They aren't immune from manipulation, however they still move forward carrying a lot of hope. Anyways, I'm amazed at how he did a complete 180 on the mishmash that was Kitty Cat. Yuka is feeling a lot more three-dimensional to me and I love their new design. They're definitely going to be an interesting character to develop throughout their story and they're capable and determined enough to earn some of the titles back that they lost in the redesign. Maybe not the animal superhero one though. Steffa is the main villain of the Wotu series. I created her originally as a foil for Kitty Cat. Steffa is our corrupted angel of light who represented all things evil. Originally, she was rude to Kitty Cat from the moment that Cynthia created them, constantly putting Kitty Cat down for being inferior to them morally. So Steffa would be horrible and mean because she thought she was more good than Kitty Cat? This does make her sort of hateable, but also... What? Her original, original design was this evil-looking, straight-haired, blonde, blue-eyed girl. Take one guess at who I had beef with as a kid. But later, I reworked her design so that when she was corrupted by murdering Cynthia, she took the fall harder. She turned from a sweet, kind-looking girl into an utter monster. For the redesign, I decided to make them non-binary and also change their name to something which fit their new job better, Clay. Their new law better parallels Yuka and doesn't have as much of a strong moral undertone as the Angel of Light. Instead, they are now the divine architect of the world in training. Clay is gentle and quiet, studying hard to develop the more complex chemical and physical systems of the universe. They will someday overtake Cynthia's role and watch over the universe until its eventual entropy. Their role is bigger than Yuka's, but also dependent on the existence of life, because otherwise they'd have no one to care for. So instead of Clay seeing Yuka as inferior, they now look up to them, with Yuka being their older sibling. With Clay's personality, they are extremely methodical and dedicated to their studies, being very mature despite their young appearance. When they have time off to rest, they spend it in the garden with Yuka, writing poems about all the beautiful elements of nature which they see. Yuka is very protective over their baby sibling, but also wants to show them the amazing things they can create with their powers. Clay creates whirlwinds of glittering sand and raindrops, and Yuka makes storms of petals. They both have things to teach each other, and they're incredibly close before the disaster. I aged Clay down a lot from the original design because I like the idea of them being a holy prodigy child. I think it also helps to communicate their gentle and innocent personality before their corruption. Their outfit is very limiting and close fitting, even having a cut of cloth which stops their arms from moving too far apart. But considering that Clay uses their powers to make clothes for both themselves and Yuka, it shows how they are loyal to their purpose. Rather than being bound by someone else or by Cynthia, they want to spend their time training to become the divine architect by disciplining themselves and restricting their activities to studying indoors and quietly contemplating. In the original design, they had these hair coils with little floating gems inside. I kept these on the new design because I think it hints well at their mastery over material. I mimicked this material as well in a big forehead gem. I think these make characters look kind of brainy, which Clay very much is. I also think this would be a very interesting element to mix up when I design the corrupted version of Clay in a later video. So that's all our designs done for this video. Let's take a look at the art I made to bring Cynthia, Yuka and Clay to life. Thanks so much for sticking around to the end. If you're still here and enjoyed the video, you might as well subscribe because there will be more parts of this series coming in the near future. I'd love to hear any assumptions or thoughts about these characters in the comments, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye for now.